Hello and welcome to DV Test Podcast Episode 8. I'm here to talk about flywheels today and all the cool flywheel tech in the community right now. And with me I have uh, Kelly from Kelly Industries, um, Rhino or Ryan from Make Test Battle, and Phil from Open Flywheel Project. Say hi guys. Hey oh. Hello. Hello. All right, so uh, let's jump right into it. If you guys want to go in, um, well, I guess alphabetical order, because that's how Discord sorts you, and that's just easier. Uh, and just tell us who you are, what you're doing in the like community right now, and uh, a little bit about like how you got into the hobby, that sort of thing. Uh, so let's start with uh, Ehail Kelly. All right. Uh, my internet's not great right here. Um, but yeah, I am Adrian Kelly. I run um, Kelly Industries. Um, is a store online, and I do lots of 3D printed parts for Nerf blasters, primarily flywheel blasters. Um, so I got started. I made a web store to sell a rapid strike select fire circuit board. Um, and then I saw Open Flywheel Project was taking off, and started selling those instead. <laughs> Select fire circuit board never got done. Uh, Phil, quick overview for those who missed uh, the episode of the podcast that was all about you. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Philip Sweeting. I'm a mechanical engineering graduate. Um, Open Flywheel Project started as an effort to create open source flywheel cages which improved performance because I was too cheap to buy Artifact Red. Um, and enough people got interested in it that I started a business out of it. And Ryan. Well, hi everyone. I'm Ryan from Make Test Battle. And uh, I got into flywheel blasters when the Rapid Strike came out and have been loving them ever since. Uh, I've gone on to different things but flywheels always been my love um i started with the introduction of the make Test battle rhino motor a long time ago maybe two and a half years now when the falcon which was the go-to kind of disappeared and uh, since then i've been trying to bring out new motors new lines and just try and educate people on the physics and understanding of how uh these things actually work and trying to kill some of the dogma which i think is mostly gone nowadays so yeah, that's that's what gets me going. All right, so all of you have taken a particular interest in flywheels as opposed to springers. Um, so what kind of drove you to the flywheel side of the Nerf hobby as opposed to the springers? Uh, in the same order, Kelly, you go first. All right. Um, I really like the rate of flyer that flywheels provide. Um, it seems like there's just a limitation of how much physical energy you can input into the dart with your arms, um, whether that's from like springers or like pumping an air blaster. And so uh, things like flywheels or HPA just get around that, allow you to have way more rate of fire and be way more effective. And it's actually much simpler as well. You can do um, lots of cool electrical stuff. And um, yeah, flywheels are really cool. What about you, Phil? Um, I really like the, the mechanical simplicity of them. Um, they just seem, they're very appealing to me in that there's only a few moving parts. There's no super complicated mechanisms or anything. Uh, and I also find that I just have way more fun playing a high rate of fire, lower velocity game, especially like playing mixed FPS with groups. I'd way rather play with guys i just enjoy enjoy the more and what about you ryan well i've um really got into flywheels when i moved down to melbourne when i started my uh, phd and um the reason i really liked them is that in our events in melbourne at the time everyone was using very long range low rate of fire and as uh kelly was saying if you get up in someone's face with a rapid strike that throws 14 darts a second, it, you know, you compensate for the fact that you can't really shoot as far by just hailing down a swarm of darts. So the 
effectiveness of flywheels at our events really got me into them. And same with HVZ, it's all about that rate of fire. And um, this, the, as 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 uh, Phil said, the the simplicity that is a flywheel blaster at the end. You know, you have um, you know two things: you have a switch and you have some motors, and that's that's really it. You know, um, so that's why I like them. They're so easy to get something that is very simple um, and very effective at an event. Uh, very cool. So for those who like have not been following the sort of evolution of flywheel over the past um, couple of years or so, uh, do you guys want to like just quickly do like a brief history um, starting with like throwing nine volt batteries into Ravens to the point where literally every piece inside a flywheel blaster is now 3d printed and manufactured and you can build like 200 FPS, uh, flywheels. Um, so I don't know it, whoever like feels like they have the best grasp on being able to explain this history can go for it. I don't think going in order here makes sense. Well, I can definitely talk to the motors. Um, I don't know about you guys. You definitely more into the sort of cage and, and flywheel and parts side. But I'll start off with the motors because for me, that's you know a fairly big deal. Um, when I first bought the Rapid Strike, the Rapid Strike was my first flywheel blaster. No, no, it wasn't. I bought a Strife. Sorry. When the Strife first came out, this was the era of the RM2 motor. And, um, you know, that, that was back when... No one had really sort of sat down and thought, okay, what, what are we actually doing with these things? So the RM2 motor, for anyone who, who doesn't know it, was a copper brushed um, six volt motor that was pressed into service, massively overvolted, had a lifetime of about 10 seconds when you actually used it. And it just wasn't very good by modern standards. But at the time, it's what people knew. And so when I first got into the strife, that was that was the thing. And then going forward from there, people scoured eBay, they scoured AliExpress, they scoured, you know, all of these websites trying to find better motors than the RM2 or the, you know, um, blades or 3240s or just all these random sort of motors that came up. And eventually, because all these motors were basically factory seconds or orders that hadn't been picked up they all kind of dried out a bit. And so when the Falcon motor, which was a carbon brushed motor, um, which is very important, uh, disappeared, I sort of stepped up and, and brought in the, the MTB Rhino. And then we went to replace the Ranson motor, which was a very high rate of fire pusher motor with the Honey Badger. And uh, then I did 180 versions and... Um, uh, then we've got Foam Blast coming out with their Michelles, which were a 2S motor, and Lipos, and man, that's a whole nother story. Um, and now we've got a whole sort of almost ecosystem of, of different motors to the point where it's not just one choice. And that's something that I'm actually quite glad has happened because, you know, before it was just me and, and random eBay motors, and now we have at least three or four different people making them. Uh, so if Phil and Kelly want to talk about the uh, the cage aspect of it. Sure. So I'll start a little bit about the cage. Um, for a long time, people considered the stock geometry. It's like a hard limit or the glass ceiling. And Brian's original, uh, original paper, which is one of my, it was, that paper was so great reading that and thinking about it couldn't have done anything I did without without that white paper you put out. So thank you. Um, you know, why why should we limit ourselves to Hasbro's tech? Why should we why should we limit ourselves to that? And so the I guess the artifact red DRS cage uh, made advances in other areas with accuracy and slight FPS things, but artifact red was the first one to improve the critical velocity, to actually raise the glass ceiling by improving the critical velocity of the cage. Did that, did that with more crush. Um, so that crush was gained by the improved wheels. Uh, I The Artifact Red was the inspiration for Open Flywheel Project. The goal was to get the same performance with stock wheels that Artifact Red got with its wheels so that you could get the same performance without paying any money at all. Um, at the time, I didn't understand concavity. I didn't understand a lot of the systems. 
Uh, but that's how that 41 and a half millimeter number came out. It's what if it's the spacing you have to use on the motors to get the same gap that Artifact Red gets with its larger wheels. Um, sometime in, in March or so this year, I started thinking about concavity and gripping the dart more completely and trying to bring it closer to hoop stress um, and try to get more even deformation and more normal force out of the same amount of compression. Uh, and that that was that led to riot. So that concept, I didn't take that all the way, and it's still only a mild concavity. Let's take that concept to its ludicrous extreme with a circle that the dart has to travel through, pure hoop stress, really deforming the dart um, in a more efficient way to maximize normal force per per Ryan's original um, white paper. Uh, has led to some pretty insane FPS numbers. Uh, the last war, I was averaging 200 FPS out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And at the same time, that's kind of supported by the development of motor technology and um, you know 3D printing as well. I think we owe a lot to the the establishment of 3D printing because you know you guys can print off ten prototypes in a in a week, and uh, instead of trying to rely on you know china or people who have cnc machines doing stuff out of aluminium very expensively you know you guys can just whip up a cad model and then you know two hours later have and, and test and play and go from there and uh adrian i don't know if you have anything left to add that they didn't cover but your chance um yeah so i haven't seen too much of the evolution of flywheel technology. Um, I got out of the hobby when like um, the uh, Raven was coming out and then I got back in um, like quite when OFP was starting up. So, but just in the time from like when OFP started like um, almost a year ago now, um, it's been amazing the advancements in the hobby of um, not only the number of parts available, um, also our understanding of um, the physics behind the dart. And so um, like the three of us have all done a bunch of math and um, Ryan wrote a cool simulation of um, like the inertia um, that's held in the wheels and you need to have enough kinetic energy. You need to have the wheel spinning fast enough to um, maintain a certain uh, velocity of the dart. And so um, once we start, um, reaching these higher velocities, we're going to need to start getting faster motors as well. And so the whole system needs to work together. Yeah, and that's that's something I, I really quite enjoy about this whole flywheel thing is even though it is so simple, you know, you get two motors, you get two flywheels, you put them in a little plastic thing and then you connect up a LiPo, you can go so deep and so involved in thinking about just exactly how you want to do each of those steps, you know. Um, seeing how much the different crush affects the performance, the spin-up times, you know, and that's, I, I, I really enjoy that as, as people probably know from the different papers and stuff that I've written on it. But uh, it is really cool that, you know, it's deep as well as wide and also accessible to anyone who just wants to throw two motors in. Yeah. Sorry. I cut out there a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think, and that's something that 3D printing has made possible because you can't see and see all these different options. But with 3D printing, there's one for everyone, no matter what plaster spacing you want. So you can tailor your build. I don't know if that was covered while I was. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's important. I think that's important. You know, right right yeah. now I have on my desk a whole bunch of different um, cages that I believe were originally OFP cages that were modified, um, you know, that is even going into brushless, you know, and that's something that I didn't even think of when I first started into these motors and stuff. And just someone somewhere in the world has come up with that idea, put the files out there, and, and now I can make my own. It's It's incredibly cool. Yeah, so... I don't know if we want to get into brushless already, um, but that's one of the things that brushless lets you do is if you use um, brushless outrunners, you can mount 
3D printed wheels on them. And that way you can test a whole bunch of different wheel geometries without paying to get um, CNC metal or plastic wheels, ideally, uh, made. Um, and so, yeah, there's really two different types of brushless, which have totally different benefits. And I feel like when people just say brushless, they get them confused a lot. Um, yeah, brush, brushless is a, a very big kettle of fish that, um, you know, I, I yeah. see it as definitely a way that some people are going to go mm -hmm. forward. But personally, I think that if you can achieve the same FPS result with a brushed motor, I don't see it being adopted as completely as, you know, lipos have now. Um, there's just a lot more Absolutely. involvement in terms of like the programming side and, and that sort of thing. In fact, I actually have a, a fun little anecdote about brushless motors, if you'll, you know, give me a few <laughs> minutes to tell it. Um, when I first received the Rapid Strike, um, I think that was in 2012. I can't quite remember. It was quite a while ago. When it first came out, I got my hands on one, took it into the UAV lab where I was studying my um, degree at the time. And uh, one of the, the lab techs looked at it and said, oh, you know, why are you using, you know, those tiny little brushed motors? Chuck a pair of, you know, brushless outrunners in it and it'll do great. And I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. We have these amazing motors. They're called RM2s. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and just, you know, totally brushed that aside. And and then, uh, what do you know, six years later or whatever, we're back here with the uh, brushless motors and exactly what he sort of suggested offhand and I dismissed. Yeah, yeah. Brushless is so is, brushless is so complicated for a drop-in thing. I think the hobby the hobby has moved for better or worse, and you can debate it towards a kit build player. Um and brushless yeah. makes it a lot harder to do that. So from a in and um business perspective, if I can get any if I can get performance using your motors that I'll beat or come close to the ultra strife, that's that's where people want to be, and that's where I want. That's where I want to be too. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and I guess on that, um, you know, I think part of the problem with brushless motors, as you're saying, is that accessibility factor. You know, when you go from soldering, you know, a few things together, that's a skill that you can teach pretty much anyone with, you know, a simple YouTube video. But you know, the the problem solving that can happen when you're trying to upload to an Arduino, you know, if you're not familiar with it then it can be a little bit daunting, I think, for a new player. So, um, yeah, the brushless motors will have a place, but they definitely will not overtake everything. That's absolutely for certain. So this is something that I've been wanting to work on, is um, making a circuit board to make brushless motors more accessible. Um, I feel like they're never going to overtake brush motors um, and be like the majority of the hobby. Um, but I think there's there's a place for them for, for example, trying out different wheel geometries. Um, and if you want to use like super big wheels that don't fit in um, like a normal blaster, and then you can't buy wheels that big, so you have to 3D print wheels, which means using brushless outrunners. Um, or if you want to get like super ridiculously fast spin up times, which I would say Neo Hellcats are going to be fast enough for anybody, but um, if you want super fast spin up times, you could use brushless inner runners. And so hopefully we'll have some options in the market soon to um, make those more accessible to people. Um, so you, you say, sorry, I just jumping in spin up times. That's one of the things that I love most about the brushless sort of cage that I've printed. And I'm, I'm working on a, a build guide sort of tutorial thing for at the moment. Uh, it's not the spin up times, it's the spin down times that I really like. I like the fact I can press a button, fire a dart, release a button, and the motors almost instantly stop just as fast as they started. <laughs> it's it's so cool. It's such a different experience for a flywheel blaster, and it it's really quite novel. So that's something I think that will also attract a lot of people is that you don't have this angry swarm of bees in your hands constantly. <laughs> can't you do, and that's uh, you do you that can't. with brush motors? Can you do that with brush? You, wire you can. It, you, can. Yeah, you, can. you can do you motor like brush with brush. But I, I guess I mean from like a sound perspective, um, you know, just that aesthetic kind of thing that brushed motors will never achieve that, I think. 
uh, at the war on Saturday, just on a sound perspective, I was running 3D printed wheels on brushed um, brushed 180s for prototyping purposes. Uh, and they sounded horrible, like the worst thing I've ever held in my hand. It was demonic. But um, they did hold for a good three or four hours before they fell off long enough for me to get, you know, get some tags, get some performance data and know that this is this was the geometry I wanted to move forward with. So you can prototype. You can't I don't recommend it, but you can prototype on a um, on a standard shaft. All right, so you guys answered like one or two questions that I had for later on the show, but that's okay. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to... Yeah, we read the question list, sorry. <laughs> that's totally... Wait, that was a question list? <laughs> that's okay, it's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to ask during the like history of uh, flywheels is I remember a time when like 120 to 130 was like this glass ceiling um, of like this is where flywheels are and this is where we're going to be and now we're getting to like 200 fps is where flywheels are going are getting to do you think we're going to have do you think the glass ceiling is just going to keep expanding for as long as we keep pushing it or do you think there's still some sort of glass ceiling where we will hit it and that is that's basically it for the tech that we can put in our blasters um, I'd, I'd love to answer like this sort of a little bit with describing what the glass ceiling kind of is uh, for anyone who hasn't sort of read and understood the the physics things. And then I'll you know, sort of open it up to the people actually making the parts. But from a physics point of view, the glass ceiling comes down to energy transfer. And if, if you think about um, a flywheel as a car, it's kind of a bad example because the flywheel is effectively skidding the whole time. And so based on your crush, the amount of force that you're putting on the dart, you only put so much energy per second into the flywheel. And so the reason why you hit that 120 is because that was just simply the amount of energy that would go into a dart in a stock cage with stock crush when it was working optimally. And so by increasing the force, you get more energy in, you get more glass ceiling. So the kind of idea of glass ceiling was, I think it's a bit of an outdated term because it's really, um, I guess it was seen as an, uh, a limit that really doesn't exist now that we can arbitrarily create crush levels that we want. But in a short answer, I, I think there will be a limit because at some point you won't be able to pull on a dart harder and you will just tear the head off every time or rip the dart foam in half or, or something. There's a there's a physical mechanical limit to how much energy you can put in. Have we hit that yet? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but again, you can always just add another stage, put more acceleration by adding more time that the dart is between flywheels. I will personally say I have become a convert against Two stage. I built the two stage RS, two stages of 41.5 millimeter with worker wheels. It was cool. It hit 180 FPS. It was fun. It was a huge pain in the ass to wire. It was clunky. It stuck out of the shell. It was ugly. It was loud. It was inaccurate because you have multiple things you have to align. Um, I think single stage of the future, I'd rather see. Uh, large format stuff like Turex high con setup, but with uh, actual with um, improved crush compared to his, which is kind of what Eclipse is, just scaled down to fit in a stripe cage. But I, I think, based on like the feedback I've been getting on my systems, I think a lot of people are pretty happy at the 200 FPS level, and there's gonna be not that much push to innovate till the gameplay and FPS limits catch up, at least in America, because um, people are talking about capping ultra stock at 200 or 220. Yeah, and, and, and another there. sort of factor, I guess, that's not even related to the flywheels is the darts themselves. You know, If I have a springer that throws a dart at 200 FPS and a springer that th throws a dart at 150, most of the time I'd probably go to the 150 because it's probably going to be more accurate. Uh, and I say that from you know a 
kind of a year ago standpoint, but with I guess with Spring is you've got you know Scar Barrels and Stephens. What I'm really interested to see is when um, you know people start transitioning to Stephens through flywheels because in my Absolutely. experience yeah. they're more accurate, Absolutely. and Absolutely. I can't wait to see that. I think uh, Adrian did some math on that back when we were in college. Um, I forget the results exactly. Maybe you can speak more to it, but I think it was like. 20% of the energy transfer at most comes from the foam. Most of it's from the head. Yeah, I ran some real quick numbers and, and found something like that. I, I got between five to 10 times the uh, force on the head than the foam by doing some testing with half lengths and some other people's numbers. Yeah, so I, I think what, like what people have said before, we're getting close to the limits of um, what we can fit inside of the. Um, mounting points for a normal nerf blaster um so like eclipse it's shooting like 200 fps with um accufakes i think that's pretty close to the limit unless you want to try like serrations or something but then you're popping a bunch of dart heads off um uh, i think we can go significantly significantly larger wheels and get more fps by spreading out the acceleration over a longer distance that way um but yeah, I would question like, I know we said this at like 130 FPS of like, why do we need more FPS? But um, I feel like at 200, it starts to get painful enough that you don't want to go much higher. Um, but going to half lengths, uh, the FPS hit is acceptable um, if you can just put like a higher FPS cage in and then you get back to whatever standard you deem is acceptable pain-wise. Um, so yeah, I would definitely agree half lengths are the next step for yeah. flywheel technology. Yeah, if you take an Eclipse cage shooting 200 FPS and you throw Stefan's through and it drops down to, I don't know, 160, 170, it doesn't even really matter the number, but it's like, you know, that's incredible performance. Yeah, yeah I really just wish the Katana Megs were not design the way oh, they are. Oh, don't even get me started on the oh, they are, My they, fucking they God. From the front. You can't make them feed from the front. They jam in the mag well. It's so annoying. Let's just design our own so, blasters and 3D print them for Katana Yeah, <laughs> yeah basically. Uh, I'm, yeah. you know, looking at that already. <laughs> <laughs> we all ventured down that path to some extent. Not sure. I know yeah. Adrian and I are different levels of complete. I'm Rhino's probably ahead of us. Oh, dude, I have way too many things on my plate. It, it Actually, yeah, a, a mate of mine is working on a Katana brushless thing. But again, if it happens, it happens. But yeah, gosh, I, Katana Max would have been an absolute boon if they had a, uh, been designed to fit in the front half of a magwell. It's yep. easy to make an adapter, too, to make a new one that feeds from the front. No, because the shape of it doesn't fit at the front of a magwell. Even with nothing around, oh, you, really? can't get a, you can't get a katana all the way to the front of the magwell. If you could, I'd have I'd have, I'd have had a three D printed adapter for it released like weeks ago. Yeah, my my expectation was to buy okay. katana mags, reprint an adapter, put them at the front of the magwell, and yeah. then use that actually for HPA retaliators. Well, now after <laughs> playing. After after seeing some katanas in person on Saturday, what I kind of want to do is I want a uh, mag fed through the handle and with an oh, yes. gauge in front and an RS pusher in the back. Yeah. And just have <laughs> and like the get someone to make me that MP7 car. body kit. We've been thinking along the same lines. <laughs> so this kind of got on to the question I was going to ask next anyway. Um, which you guys kind of answered already, but um, have we outgrown the Strife, the Rapid Strike shell? Have we? Are we getting to the point where we're outgrowing it and we are at the point where to innovate further, we need to start building our own from scratch blasters, completely 3D printed or uh, manufactured by a company like the Exus shell? Not going to go too deep into that, but um, you guys kind of answered that, but if you guys have anything else to say, feel free to now. Oh. I think I'd like to clarify my position to make sure that 
um, you know, I absolutely adore the Strife and Rapid Strike shells, you know, um, and the amount of stuff that has already been made for them, the body kits that exist, you know, flared mag wells, extended mag releases. I love it. And I think the thing when someone makes like a uh, Blaster Forge PH or, you know, if someone makes a shell, if it doesn't look like I want it to look, then it's not attractive to me. Whereas a Strife is such a, you know, adaptable thing. You've seen the number of body kits that F10 and Worker and whoever have made. It's, you know, it's a canvas. And I don't think the Strife will ever be outdated. And the day Hasbro stops selling them will be a very sad day for me. I, I agree um, with regards to the fact that the RS and Strife are fundamental to the hobby at this point. And I don't think they're ever going to go away. Um, there's too much entrenched stuff in terms of machine cages, uh, you know, 180s, uh, motor sizes, wheel sizes designed around fitting within those screw bosses. I don't think we need to go outside of that for innovation, but I think that could be a very promising path, especially if um, high FPS games really take off. We have a really seen any long-term use of ultra strikes or eclipse because no one i haven't finished making them yet but um but i think we'll see how those shells hold up to that kind of repeated high impact um high load system and whether we actually need to start looking for alternatives um in the very least in terms of orientation of things, mag fit through the handle, you know, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's something where the ho where the hobby community can provide more of exactly what we want. And also, you know, like you mentioned, Hasbro one day is going to stop selling the strap and they're going to stop selling the rapid strike. Uh, I think as this hobby's grown, it's grown rapidly in terms of aftermarket parts in the last. Um, and the fact that we're still dependent on Hasbro for this stuff leaves us beholden to them um, in a way which absolutely to grow in the future. We need to have our own sources. When Worker made the prophecy, I was secretly fingers crossed that they're going to make the you know I don't know what they're going to call it, but you know a replacement Strife shell. Yeah, so that's one of the things I've been working on um like some 3d printed shells and so like i got like 80 percent through a 3d printed bullpup and got like a working pusher mechanism um so like full auto raven sort of thing but with um like a cage that could accept like dual stage or large wheels um and the issue with that was just the time and cost of 3d printing a shell is so much larger than we can buy shells for right now from Hasbro. So yeah. I think um, right. yeah, injection right. molded shells are always going to be here. It was something like 50 hours of printing um, for the bullpup shell, um, which would be like a 150 bucks just for the shell is ridiculous. Nobody would pay for that. Um, and so I think eventually we're going to see injection molded flywheel blasters um and uh, i really wish uh, one of these companies um that's making aftermarket injection molded shells would be making flywheel blasters but uh, i really wish I, had in I really wish i had thirty thousand dollars to drop on injection molding <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i mean for me the other thing i guess this is a personal opinion i kind of look at anything that's 3d printed and think prototype or unfinished hmm. or draft. And so when, when people start saying, oh, I'm going to make this 3D printed shell, it's like, mm, no, you're trying to make a shell and you have to 3D print it because you're not at the level where it's a, you know, injection moldable part. So I, when I, whenever I see a 3D printed shell, it's kind of like, mm, it's not done yet, you know? I so I'm, I'm really that. excited to see the first printed flywheel sorry not sorry the first injection molded aftermarket flywheel option see i really believe in the future of 3d printing like i'm designing my own 3d printer um for the sort of like mass production 
that I'm doing now with cages. Um, so I'm just trying to drive down the cost of 3D printing even more to make things like um, printed shells more accessible. Um, and if, if you print a pistol shell, it's obviously going to cost a lot less than I was saying for a bullpup. But um, I don't know. I think that might just be a, a stigma that we have around. Yeah, and as I said, pistol printing. size. Right, okay. Um, I mean, I don't know if you have that same feeling about like 3D printed body kits or whatever, but um, I don't personally see being 3D printed as an issue. Yeah, the, the body kits is a different issue for me, I guess. And that's sort of a, a separate thing. Um, I see the, the body kits as, um, you know, they're, they're, yeah, that's that sort of flips on my head what I just said. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for a shell is different to a body kit, I think, in my view. Yeah, so one thing we need to be definitely. One thing you can do with. Sorry, I guess saying? the sorry the other thing is I I this is totally separate note I hate the idea of a shell making two halves that come together is just such a terrible way of manufacturing an actual thing look at any firearm and find me one that's a shell and you know I'll I'll send you an e dollar I tried to design a blaster that's not a shell like and two halves and it's way more complicated to like three D print and manufacture than. Oh yeah, that's it's much easier. that's that's what I'm doing for that um, Springer that I've mentioned that I want to bring out. It's not a shell, but it is much more difficult. Yeah, um, but these are the things we do. Lazy. We don't do it easy. <laughs> Sorry, Hasbro, Hasbro is cheap. They're making toys. All these are toy grade things, and flywheels in particular have actually very little structural loading on them. So the clamshell design makes good sense in my opinion for a flywheel system my dream ideal flywheel if i could just go and do it would be you would it would still be injection molded as clamshell pieces but then they'd be assembled together permanently in a way you know you could remove the receiver and you could take apart everything uh CETA style but they would have to be molded in uh clamshell style Um, I don't know how much you guys are into firearms and stuff like that, but if you look at uh, guns like, you know, F2000 and a lot of bullpups, they have this idea of the trigger pack that you sort of have this yeah. contained box that you insert into the blaster. And if you had something, you know, I'm talking a, a lot down the line where you throw in your cage wheels mosfets and it just plugs into the blaster when you throw in your you know cage pack that's a cool idea you know and that's where i'd love to see hmm. this go to in you know whenever fantasy land it happens yeah so one interesting thing i was thinking you could do with 3d printed shells is you were saying with the strife you can since it's a small blaster, you can put all these different body kits on it and change it to be whatever you want. With a 3D printed shell, you can modify the actual design files and do that to an even larger extent of, um, if the files are open source and in an easily editable format, um, so not STL, you can- But not after the uh, fact, make, once you've printed it. No, 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 but, so you could modify the files and then print um, whatever, like shape around the shell that you want to make it look like whatever real steel firearm or whatever aesthetic you like. Yeah, I, I think, I guess for, for body kits and, and that sort of aesthetic idea, it, it really helps to have something that people can, you know, modify like modular, you know, when, when workers sat down and did their body kits, they said, Hey, we're going to make this thing that goes on the front of every strife so that we, you can just push on your body kit onto it. And with a, a 3D printed mm -hmm. shell, you need to be able to make it modular because people are going to buy a shell and then change it later, um, change different bits up. Not everyone knows how to do 3D modeling. Yeah, that, that's right. sort of important, I think. Yeah, so that's something I did with 
my 3D printed blaster, I made it. So um, yes, it was a clamshell, but there was also separate modular pieces. Like you could swap out the handle or the whole front section or the cage um, was actually built into the shell, but you could swap out that part of the shell that had the cage built into it, or you could swap out the whole stock portion. I will admit I have not seen any pictures or renders, so I, I can't really comment informedly, okay. I guess. Yeah, no worries. So the next question was also one that was kind of answered earlier, uh, but I'll let you guys take the opportunity to say more about it if you have anything left to say about it, which was um, with the Neo Hellcats coming out, and all these like super um, high torque motors. Um, you guys kind of touched upon this already and answered this, but is there still a point to brushless? Is there still like a need for brushless innovation? Um, or are we like, if, um, if the Neo Hellcats are like this high torque already only like two years after Rhinos came out, um, and we're just accelerating so fast over this past year. Um, are we going to outgrow brushless or are we going to keep uh, seeing the need for it in various capacities? Well, that's a fairly simple maths question. Uh, there's two sort of limiting factors and uh, Neo Hellcats, in my opinion, are the last like 180. Um, you can only put so much energy through a piece of copper before it gets so hot that it melts its insulation, shorts, and dies. Um, and on top of that, you if you think about a blaster throwing X number of darts at X velocity, that is a certain amount of energy going outwards. And simply put, brushless motors can put more energy in so you can get more power coming out of the blaster in terms of you know darts per second at velocity X. So brushless motors will always be better and well, not, not, not necessarily like every brushless motor is better than every brushed motor, but the potential for a brushed motor hits a wall with the limit of heat and copper's, you know, melting. And especially um, heat and flywheel cages. I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen when I put 4S Neo Hellcats in a printed Eclipse cage. I'm not sure if it'll be pretty doing rapid fire in 90 degree weather. I, I did do a test. Uh, when I first got the uh, the rhinos, I put a pair of rhinos and just sat them in a flywheel cage and ran them for a few hours. And after about three hours of running the rhinos, the cage had melted such to the point that it was absolutely useless. Um, and so, you know, what you say is a very good point. A, a rhino motor is drawing eight amps at 12 volts at stall. Um, a Neo Hellcat draws five times as much at stall and you know three times as much at idle so you know yeah exactly i was actually thinking about this i know um on jet turbines they channel air through the inside of the blades to cool the blades and so the then that way they can run it at higher temperatures without melting the turbine blades and yes, that's very cool stuff. It's <laughs> my it's my favorite engineering solution to any problem. I love it so much. But I was wondering if you could put grooves on the inside of a flywheel to generate airflow, intentionally generate airflow around the motor casing, around around like the socket to cool it down and um improve performance. It'd be a have, real have you seen the uh, ultrasonic two brushless setup? Uh, I haven't looked into his exact setup, but if it... Well, he, yeah, the wheels similar. that he has printed actually have a series of holes. And the idea is that they act to ram air down onto the motors underneath. Um, I think it could definitely be improved by angling the holes in the direction of rotation. But yeah, exactly. you trying to force yeah, cooling yeah. Into the yeah. motors. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Active cooling. And I think one of the, the builds that I saw a very long time ago, I think it was a rapid red, instead of doing a uh, 3D printed cover, this person just put, I think it was like two 40 millimeter fans on the side of their blaster. And that was just yeah, totally, yeah, totally useless awesome. at the time. 
but very cool and relevant now. <laughs> yeah. So um, seeing a, a brushless, uh, sorry, seeing a, a, a 40 millimeter or 25 millimeter fan flywheel cage cover. That's, I'd, I'd like to see someone make that. I think I saw a printed motor cover, which fit 25 millimeter fans on, I forget where, on Nerf Motors Welcome or somewhere the other day. And I thought, hey, that's cool. But I don't think the files were released. I don't know. Personally, I would like to avoid having fans on the outside of my blaster, but that's just me. Um, what, you don't want more motors? <laughs> hey, Ryan, what are you going to get? I have fan motors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you need all that fan torque. Um, back to the brushless topic. Um, I feel like normal Hellcats were already like fast enough spin up time. And so things like Cronus are basically instant, and Neo Hellcats are even faster. So the math says um, brushless has something like two times the torque of Neo Hellcats. Um, and so because of brushless, your spin up time is actually a little lower. So you get like 50% faster spin up time than Neo Hellcats, but like who cares? I don't think anybody's going to want to spend the extra money for that 50% extra spin up time um, or lower spin up time, unless it's just for the bling factor. I don't know. Um, and like I, I guess said that's before, why I sort of said energy, really, not in terms of spin time, because, you know, a, a, a Neo Hellcat is, I think it's about a 35 watt motor at its optimal loading, whereas you can get brushless motors up to, you know, 1500 watts. And, um, it's it's yeah, about rate of fire. We're not running know. at the optimal loading, though. No, yeah, but what, what, what I'm saying is the amount of energy that a, a, a motor can put in is limited at its highest RPM. And so if you want more power yeah. in in order to get high FPS but also high rate of fire, then you need to start looking at different solutions. And that's where brushless um, comes into my mind. I was, something I was looking at, I wasn't looking into it, but I thought of the other day. I can't find any... Thing on the internet about this but ryan you might be able to answer it for a 180 motor we we just want something which can fit inside our stock wheels why do we need to have it flat can like that could we get some custom motor can which was round still 20 oh, absolutely meters? but it's what hasbro and, did so it's what we had to fit within yeah but we don't anymore we all have our own cages now and plenty of cages are sized for 20 millimeter brushless anyway so could we get a round, a fully round, um, brushed 180 length motor, which could fit more copper fill and get more power and still not have the complication of brushes? I mean, you know, by that same logic, we can go to 280s, 380s, 480s. It's, you know, it's, I guess it's just, they're the standard. And so I, I've always stuck with the 180 with the flat type cans because not everyone has a riot cage that can take 20 millimeter in runners and stuff like that. So it's a compatibility thing. And, you know, I, it's difficult to change motors without changing everyone's cages. And, you know, it's sort of chicken and egg yeah. at that point. I mean, it's we easy to print new cages, but the issue I see is just like a cost issue of like, there are round can 280s or 380s on the market. There are no round can 180s. Like they do not exist. You would have to get a manufacturer to create this new standard from scratch which would be ridiculously expensive yeah exactly uh, yeah and so would it, it be would that be much cool. better i don't know i don't think it's that worth it yeah but like i was saying before like if you get 20 percent more torque than neil hellcats with a round can who cares <laughs> yeah well it, it's sort of the point of you know you fire at a maximum rate of fire. And if, if the motors can achieve that, then yeah, there's not really much point pushing them further. Where motor technology goes from here in terms of brush motors, I don't know, actually. I'm really not sure. Isn't that the argument you used for 130s like two years ago? No, oh, it is. It is. And <laughs> I, I think I just said what I said two years early because for, right. personally, the Neo Rhinos is where I think it's at. Oh, because yeah. Because that's absolutely. Hellcat performance with no shell cutting. I'm really excited for Neo Rhinos. I'm going to be using them in a lot of blasters. Um, yeah, I want to put but, them on 4S and see what they do in Eclipse. 
I, I don't know if they'll handle heat as well as a Hellcat because the coil is smaller, but um, you know, you're more than welcome to burn up a few finding out. <laughs> <laughs> then I can buy more. I have no problem with that. But yeah, it, it does reach a point where it's kind of like, you know, do we need to push the bleeding edge further? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I think we've been at the point where the motors keep up with the rate of fire like a long time ago. Um, like, I haven't seen that issue with Hellcats. Um, oh, but for the Eclipse cage, I don't think any motor currently exists to put, you know, 15 darts per second at 200 FPS through an Eclipse cage. Absolutely not. Hmm. I can say a motor does exist which can do that, and I cannot reveal any more information about it, unfortunately. <laughs> I'll don't be like that. But I had them in my cage. At, I had them in my cage on Saturday, and they were ridiculous. Average that they ran down a fifteen hundred milliamp hour graphene pack, two and a half hours. Nice. So the math that I did said that. As long as you don't stall the motors, higher stall current motors don't actually draw more power um, in normal use. Um, so the yeah, the, the idle currents current, are still quite low. Yeah, idle currents are the same. Yeah, uh, or so I think what actually increases the power draw is um, as you're spinning the wheels faster, you're creating more air resistance, and that's drawing more power um, and creating more heat. These were also really heavy wheels. They were based off of uh, Ryan's inertia calculations, and I extended the the um, web of the wheel all the way up to be flush with the top of the shaft. And then I printed them at 100% infill, so they were probably maybe 12 grams each at least. Yeah. Um, and that, did, that inertia was that a, did it work? I don't know. Them. The inertia was definitely helping them sustain the rate of fire. Hooray. <laughs> the math works. Yeah. It's always good when that happens. I have to say the spin up time still left something to be desired for the milled eclipse wheels I'm doing. I'm cutting them back a little bit and bringing them closer to regular wheels. Um, just looking at it from like a how I, I use it. I do snapshots way more often than I do sustained five or six shot bursts where I need full mm -hmm. velocity. What, uh, what type of game was that? Was that a uh, HVZ or was that a NIC type of thing? Uh, this was NIC. Um, it was, well, it was, it was an ultra stock. We, we capped at 300 FPS, but we had players running two Eclipse setups, a Riot, a couple other high-end flywheel systems, He's a uh, hopper, a couple hoppered homemades. Dennis was there as well, and he can talk about it. Yeah, it was but a it was a really yeah, good mix fun. of just about everything you could have. Uh, at our highest, we had um, Rob with a, a 4B shooting like 300 FPS, and at our lowest, we had like a overpower, like a what do you call it? expanded hopper nemesis shooting like 120 to 130. So we had like that whole range of capacity versus um versus high fps and the eclipse fit in there really well um along with riot even like 150 fps flywheels fit in pretty well there too uh but back to you guys until i rip the shaft off my motor do you guys play with shields no we had um obstacle set up though Gotcha, because that's one of the things I think we, we have at Melbourne Nerf Wars that changes the dynamic with flywheels quite a lot, is that we have a pair of shields, one one per side, and that really, really hurts long-range, lower rate of fire, higher FPS blasters compared to higher rate of fire, sort of spammy flywheels. So hmm. I think that, that also does change the kind of my thinking versus what you guys would be playing with. I'm really because for me, I just think a flywheel is just you know throw out as many darts as you can, carry fifteen mags on you, and just you know fire them all in one round. Right. Um, I think part of the reason for that is because of the accuracy isn't there, which hopefully is going to be better with these new Morpheus and Eclipse systems. But, um, 
I'm really excited to do my first uh, Ultra Stock game, which I'm organizing one in um, San Francisco next weekend, and I'll be able to try out some like cool brushless setup with um, pretty close to Eclipse geometry is what I'm doing. So this is the fact that you had a brushless stripe, like if you'd been a little bit more aggressive on <laughs> the brush, you could have you could have had the undisputed FPS championship. Yeah, like I never cronied it. It was doing what was it? It was like 160 with um waffles. Um and I built this like a year ago, like just after OFP became a thing, right? Um, and so, yeah, I wish I, like, I have way too many projects. I wish I had put more time into it and um, tried higher concavity, and which I did at first. I did it wrong and then switched back to a slightly lower concavity. But um, yeah, I, I could have been the Ultra Strife, but. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Just in time for me to change the hobby again with HPA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's where it's going ultimately. When I'm when I'm trying, to, what I was trying to do with Eclipse is not really compete with um, with NIC because NIC, for as much as it's fun, is not that many people actually play it. But it would be really cool to have a lower cost option that you could field semi competitively against the growing HPA master race. <laughs> yeah, I, HPA is a high barrier of entry for people to get into. Um, I, I think honestly, that's a myth for you guys in the states. I, I literally I mean, looked it, it up it, like two days ago. It's 120 bucks, right. and you can have a full HPA rig. Yeah, no, I made a guide like a year ago. It's like 150 bucks for the tank and the regulator. Um, that's still a fairly high barrier of entry for a lot of people, though. That's what I mean. Um, I think well, you can build the, the a big thing for, me, for a lot less. The big thing for me is filling that tank all the time and paying for it. Yeah, not, and, and not being able to for us, we, we currently play our events mainly at a paintball field, so that actually helps us quite a lot. And you know, yeah, if, that's nice. If if you have access to that, then that's great. But you know, you get a few people go five ways on a air compressor that's you know, about five hundred bucks. Yeah. Anyway, this is a bit off topic. <laughs> <laughs> I promise we'll do an HPA special sometime in the near future. Uh, but for now, uh, you guys all have companies of various kinds. Uh, some of you sell stuff. Some of you just make stuff to for other people to sell. So if you guys want to just go down the list and tell us, I don't know, what we can expect from your companies in the near future, what's new and exciting from you guys. Uh, we kind of know some of it, but maybe there's some extra you want to share or just talk about your future products a little bit more. Uh, Adrian, why don't you go first? Uh, sure. All right. Um, so I just moved to San Francisco, and so I have a big backlog of products that I'm going to be coming out with pretty soon. So I'm doing like one a day for the next week. <laughs> um, so let's see, I have um, some not flywheel stuff um, is uh, absolver like shotgun attachments. Um, so instead of like using Maverick cylinders or whatever, they're like purpose built um, three, four and seven shot um, shotgun attachments. Um, I have a way better hopper that like actually feeds full length darts properly. Um, which is something I don't think anybody's ever done before. Um, let's see, I have um, Morpheus guides are going up for sale today. That's really exciting. Um, and some of the projects I'm working on are um, like a DIY chronograph, better hyperfire belt, uh, rapid strike switch plate. Um, like I was saying, the circuit board for the brushless and a MOSFET board for brushed are both more long-term plans. But um, yeah, I have a barrel attachment afterburner in the works. Lots of stuff. Who knows when it'll actually come. <laughs> so I I just released Morpheus, which is a aluminum insert which goes into matching 3D printed cages. 
I'm pretty proud of how they made up and align. Um, this is, it's targeted for HVZ and super stock. Really, the idea is uh, it's much easier than brassing a cage. You don't have to mess around with cutting anything. You don't have to do any labor. Just buy it and you it slides in and you glue it and that's it. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be careful. Um, and you can still get that uh, accuracy bonus from a guided cage uh, at, a, at a lower cost and less labor. So that's kind of my play for HVZ and um, and like super stock on budget. Uh, I really think that's more the future. I don't, unless you're like super strapped for cash, I wouldn't recommend the old OFP cages at all. At the high end, I'm, Eclipse is my baby. It's my, it's the culmination of a lot of uh, thought and something I've wanted to do for a while. It's, you know, it's a super high concavity setup with basically the goal of absolute velocity at with no compromise. Um, it's going to be available. Wheels will be available. There'll be printed cages, which work with those wheels. And there's also going to be a milled aluminum cage, which works with those wheels. The printed cages will work, will be for all the blasters, et cetera. That's for my usual release. Um, and that's pretty much all I'm doing right now. Yeah, I'm holding a Morpheus guide in my hand right now. The machining is beautiful on these. Yeah, they look slick. I haven't had um, you know, the opportunity to get my hands on one yet, but I'll definitely be picking one or two up. And for me, well, I am biting my nails, refreshing my email address, waiting for the uh, shipping notifications for the uh, Neo Hellcats and the Neo Rhinos. Um, I think I've received more messages to make test battle personally and from all of my suppliers saying, you know, we're getting swamped. So I'm excited for those to finally be arriving. And that's burning a huge hole in my pocket. So I'm looking forward to selling a few of them. Uh, in terms of other stuff past that, I'm really, um, in terms of a product, the only thing I guess I could say I'm working on is this uh, Springer, which I guess if I was to describe it would be like the AR-15 of Springers. I want it to be a very modular and flexible um, Springer. And that, but that's sort of, I kind of looked at the caliber and went, mm, I reckon I could do a better job of this maybe. So I'm, that's, that's a very long-term project at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, that's no other real big products that I expect to, to be available soon on my horizon, just the, the Neo range. I'm very excited to get those out the door. Yeah, I can't wait for near rhinos in particular. Soon. Oh, uh, uh, no, no. I've upgraded from soon to very soon. <laughs> Bloody China uh, screwed up with... Sorry. I'm yeah, going to rant. I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> All right. So on, on that note, to close off the show... What do you guys want to see in the future of flywheel tech? Uh, at least stuff that you're not personally working on. Um, is there anything that you are looking forward to in the near future, other than the products already mentioned? Um, or what? Like, what's the next innovation you're looking forward to? What's the next step? Uh, in order, uh, Adrian, why don't you go first? All right. Um, I'm looking forward to some uh cool 3d printed blasters um so like large diameter high concavity wheels see what kind of performance people can get with that as well as um serrations is something that um seems to help the worker wheels um they get better performance than smooth wheels of the exact same specs um but nobody has done that much testing on them so um yeah i'd be interested in just, the just a note there, this. if you want to look into it, or you know, the people at home want to understand it, the reason serrations are helpful is uh, from the coefficient of friction. You're increasing the effective surface roughness. So increasing the normal force is what more crush does, whereas serrations increase the friction and coefficient. I just sort of put that in there because it's not something I don't think I've ever spoken about in my papers at great length. All right. My internet dropped out, so I have no idea what you said, but I'll listen on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Phil? Um, so I think the net, 
I'm obviously I'm looking forward to everything we discussed here. Looking forward to seeing reception, to seeing Neo Neo Motors and also um Morpheus and Eclipse. But I think that in terms of future stuff that I'm most interested in, um I really want to look into alternate flywheel materials. Uh I'm I have a dream of like a, a metal like an aluminum plate with set screw attachment to the shaft. And then you can screw down like a machined polyurethane wheel over it, something super grippy to some kind of composite structure or something. The the next step if we're talking within a um stock on envelope. But uh I think all this stuff is gonna be awesome and it's looking at how things have gone, it's so hard to predict what's gonna come next. Hey, here's an idea. Sorry, I just was thinking when you were saying just a, a plate would it be practical or possible to make a machined aluminium plate that is just a mounting for two motors that are sort of joined in the middle that you then 3D print the actual interfacing to the screw ports inside the shell? Do you think that would be a good idea, like reduce the cost of the machining uh, and increase the flexibility of it? Just a thought. I think your vibration... You're still going to have the vibration issues of a of a printed cage uh, on the screw boss attachments if you're printing those, but it'll get it'll solve all the heat issues, which is a big that's a big issue. Or it could. I'll look into it. Thank you. Yeah, just a thought. Um, yeah. Future stuff that oh, I'm no. looking forward to is definitely when. Um, you know, someone picks up the ball and carries forward the strife shell permanently because, you know, we've seen blue stripes disappear. We've now seen orange stripes disappear. We've got the modular strife disappearing in some date in the future. You know, is it going to be something that Hasbro realizes is so important to our community that they're going to continue it in one form or another? Or is it just going to disappear? You know, like, at least for me, the rapid strike in Australia, that's long gone if you want a rapid strike good luck you've got to find someone who wants to sell one or you know um it's not quite like that in the states yet but you know i'm looking forward to someone uh injection molding and carrying it forward not um, i would much altered i would much rather somebody make a new injection molded flywheel blaster than continue the strife um just because like you gave um worker shit for this right for making the prophecy like exactly like the retaliator instead of making something new and um better right oh sorry and real so, importantly that that prophecy uh all those those were justin and adrian's opinions i didn't have any sort of uh, input into that video i i, okay. I think the prophecy right. could have been done a little bit better but i like the idea i guess of continuing the retaliator but i don't think we're at risk of the retaliator disappearing as quickly also, who cares if the retaliator disappears? But um, yeah, there's a bit of that too. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think we should ever um, chain ourselves to Hasbro's engineering and design. Um, they're good at what they do, what they do, but they're not doing it for us. They're not designing for anywhere close to our uses. Um, and we should. The the community has done an amazing job, basically bodging their stuff into something awesome but we can do way better from scratch. I, I guess in a way I agree with that. Um, so long as the people like Worker and all that who make their fantastic body kits and the stuff that people really enjoy and like compatible with whatever standard. It's just, I think the Strife is a, is a standard, you know? And right. as you start doing other stuff, you have compatibility issues because I can't put my MP5 body kit on item that isn't a Strife. I don't know. That's just my thoughts, I guess. Yeah, I get that. But I do, I do totally agree with the sentiment that um, the strife is a product of its creation, and that it could be done better if we wanted to. So yeah, so I want to give us like fifty grand for injection molds. Yes, yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some anonymous benefactor. <laughs> Oh, we could pull a few kidneys together. Yeah. Kickstarter when? Go fund me for Black Alley kidney removal surgery. 
I find it amazing that um, they can justify creating injection molds for these um, body kits. Like, they must be selling a ridiculous number of them in order to make it. Sort of. We, we've molds. actually had some time talking with worker and all that and hmm. not going to expose their business and all that stuff but basically when they make an injection mold they're not looking at making a return for you know a year two years right so they they yeah. look long term and that's why certain items and definitely their popular items are molded and the rest are still printed right someone over there must have a lot of cash though <laughs> Oh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I think the uh, the people behind Worker and F10 don't do that as their primary business. I think they have a factory, and if the machines right. are idle, then they can use it for other things. Yeah, I heard the same thing for Artifact and Explorer. Oh, absolutely for Artifact. Artifact, I know that's absolutely the case, but... Um, he hasn't really done any new products recently, which is kind of disappointing. Yeah, and Explorer makes like actual rifles for the Singaporean army. Oh, is that what they do? Yeah. I've always wondered. <laughs> That's why they have so many CNC machines and everything. Gotcha. All right, so uh, on that note, I am out of questions and topics. Unless you guys have something else you guys want to talk about, feel free to jump in now. Uh, one I thing just, I'd like to jump... Oh, yeah, no, you go first. All right. All right. I'd just like to thank you, Dennis, for creating a Nerf podcast. Um, I listened to a lot of podcasts, and um, I don't know. The modcast was cool, but it seems like it's dead now. I don't know what's happening with that, Ryan. But, it. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, but yeah, it's awesome to have a podcast like this and thank you for having me on. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. This is the second time I've been on. It's a really good, really good thing you're doing. I hope it's a great reward. Yeah. Just echoing that same sentiment. I, I always like talking about stuff that I know and, you know, if you don't chat me up, I'll talk for hours. Um, it'd be really cool maybe to see some uh, community questions come in if I were to offer two cents worth of advice, um, you know, because I don't know where those questions came from, but it'd be cool to see some direct involvement maybe. I don't know. I definitely want to yeah, find fine. a better system to bring the community in more. But as you guys have noticed um, with trying to plan this and schedule this, it's really difficult to get lots of people from different countries in one place at a time. So it's hard to be like, oh, hey, these specific guests are going to be on um, next week. And so give me questions for these specific people. I might do make it easier and be like, hey, what are your questions about flywheels that you would like to ask experts, quote unquote? Um, to simplify that, but I definitely want to integrate like viewers and the community into this more, and I'm definitely going to look further into that uh, in the near future. Um, but for now, uh, scheduling these is uh, quite a task on its own. That um, oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, more community integration is definitely on the horizon. I promise. And you're going to make a podcast feed so I can listen on my phone, right? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm definitely going to do that. That's been in the that's been a plan in the works since I started this, and I just haven't had the time to go and do it properly. But that's definitely in the works as well. All right. Yeah, let me know if you want help with that. Absolutely, will do. Uh, but yeah, if anyone, does anyone else have anything they want to jump in and talk about before we finish the Flywheel podcast? If someone wants to make a device uh, to test the discharge rating of lipos, I would be very happy with that. That's a thing that exists. If someone called... wants to go through and buy one of those devices and test a bunch of the lipos we use, I would be happy with that. <laughs> uh, uh, this one is thing a DV test podcast, right? <laughs> Yeah, eventually. Yes, of course. I'll test everything at some point. You know, I just have to get around to it. 
um, yeah, I guess that wraps it up then. Um, please uh, tell all the viewers slash listeners where they can find you and your products uh, in order. Let's go with Adrian Kelly first. All right. Yeah, so my site is um, Kelly Industries. It's kellyindustries.us. Um, I'm on Facebook, and I guess I have an Instagram account, too, that I don't update. But Yeah, that's where you can get my stuff. And what about OFP? Uh, I have a website, openflyallproject.com, which has links to all the all my open source cages. If you want to contact me personally, either to become a distributor or with any questions, uh, reach out to me on my Facebook page, Open Flyall Project. And Brian? Brian? Oh, it's push to talk. Ha 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 ha. Um, I knew I'd forget that once. Um, so you can find me and the video content that I do on the Make Test Battle YouTube channel, which is just make.test.battle. You could also jump on our Facebook page uh, for that sort of stuff. Um, if you are interested in buying motors, look to my retailers. If you're looking at retailing my motors or want to buy a bunch of them wholesale, just message the Facebook page and we'll figure um, we'll go from there. I'm looking at starting up a web store potentially, but you know, that's long-term plans. Very cool. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, yeah, that is a wrap for us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, yeah, thank you. See you next time on whatever it is we do next. I'm thinking maybe Singapore, but we'll see. Go, go.